This video deals with epidemiological study designs called observational studies. The learning goals of this video are to define observational studies, to present the levels of evidence in medical research, and to become acquainted with the following types of observational studies, namely cohort studies, case control studies, cross-sectional studies, case studies and case series, and ecological studies. In experimental studies, such as randomized controlled trials, the investigator specifies the intervention. When such study designs are not possible, because it is unethical or inappropriate to either give an intervention to someone or withhold an intervention from someone, or if outcomes are rare and a very large sample size is needed, then observational studies can be useful. In observational studies, the investigator observes what happens. For example, they might observe the effect of a risk factor or treatment. The crucial difference is that investigators of observational studies do not influence who is and who is not in the exposed group. Let's say we want to find out if people who eat a high-fat diet are at a higher risk for having cancer than people who eat a low-fat diet. An experimental study forcing a group of people to engage in possibly unhealthy behavior for a prolonged period of time, that is, regular consumption of high-fat foods, would be unethical, not to mention that most people would neither accept nor comply with their diets and behaviors being determined by others. Such questions can only be studied by observing what happens to people who engage in their normal behavior. In addition to ethical considerations, it is often impractical to conduct a randomized control trial and produce meaningful results. Furthermore, observational studies may extend evidence over a larger population or longer time, making observational studies powerful in the identification of adverse events and rare events. In the traditional hierarchy of evidence pyramid, Systematic reviews and meta-analyses that synthesize all available studies on a particular research question are considered the best evidence, followed by randomized control trials, which are considered the best experimental study design. Observational studies are located in the middle of the evidence pyramid and should be used if no high-quality RCTs or systematic reviews are available to answer the question. In the next few minutes, we will present the most important features and discuss advantages and disadvantages of the most common types of observational studies. Cohort studies represent analytic studies used to investigate the causes of disease and to establish links between risk factors and health outcomes. In a prospective cohort study design, from the population, a group of people is recruited. None of them has experienced the outcome of interest, but all of them could experience it. The cohort is divided into two or more groups, according to their exposure or risk factors. The groups are followed for a period of time, and then the incidence of the outcome of interest among groups of exposed and unexposed, or less exposed, subjects is compared. The risk ratio is the ratio of the incidence in exposed persons to the incidence in non-exposed persons. It indicates the strength of the association between exposure and outcome of interest, and it is a useful measure to assess the influence of risk or protective factors of diseases. In retrospective designs, exposure is ascertained from past records and outcome of interest is ascertained at the time the study is begun. The investigator looks back into the past and compares the incidence of the outcome in the exposed and non-exposed groups. A well-known cohort study is the Framingham Health Study, which is one of the longest, most important prospective cohort studies in medical history. It started in 1948 and is still ongoing. It evaluates the development and progression of heart disease and its risk factors. The Framingham Heart Study has produced many major discoveries that have helped scientists understand the development and progression of heart disease and its risk factors. Cohort studies are the best available substitute for an experiment 
when randomization is not possible. They offer the possibility to study multiple outcomes that arise after one or multiple exposures in one cohort. They are particularly useful for evaluating the effects of rare or unusual exposures, such as exposures to toxic chemicals or adverse effects of drugs. The temporal sequence between a putative cause of a certain disease and the occurrence of the disease is clear. Cohort studies are usually very expensive because of the large amount of people that have to be followed over a long period of time. In cohort studies, long follow-up times are usually required, and it is a challenge to ensure that many people who started the study also remain until the end. Therefore, dropouts are a problem because if many people drop out, it will affect the results of the study. Cohort studies are generally not suitable to study rare diseases or outcomes because the amount of people needed to study would be too large. A case control study starts with identifying the cases, a group of individuals known to have the outcome of interest, and the controls, a group of individuals who are similar to the cases but are known to be free of the outcome. Then, the investigator looks back in time to learn about the past exposures to different possible risk factors, comparing the frequency of the exposure between the case and control group. Case control studies are concerned with the frequency and amount of exposure in subjects with a specific disease or cases and people without the disease or controls. Odds ratio is used to measure the associations between the exposure to risk factor and the disease. The odds of being exposed for cases is compared to the odds of being exposed when a control. The proper selection of cases and controls is essential to diminish biases. Both should be representative of the target population. They must have been at a similar risk of developing the outcome. Cases and controls should resemble one another in all aspects, such as age, gender, socioeconomic status, ethnicity, and occupation except for the presence of disease, to ensure their comparability. The source of controls is independent from the source of cases. In order to minimize bias, controls should be selected to be a representative sample of the population that produce the cases. For example, if cases are selected from a defined population, such as a GP register, then controls should comprise a sample from the same GP register. Here is an example of a case control study. The relationship between thalidomide, a drug given to pregnant women as a sedative and medication for morning sickness, and Lind effects in babies born in the Federal Republic of Germany between 1959 and 1960. The population at risk is represented by pregnant women. The researchers selected the cases, mothers with babies with malformations and mothers with healthy babies as controls. Then, they look back in time to identify who received the little mind during pregnancy. 89% of mothers whose babies had malformations received the treatment between the 4th and ninth weeks of pregnancy, whereas none of the control mothers had taken the drug during pregnancy. Advantages of case control studies are that they can often provide results quickly with minimum funding. They are advantageous when exposure data is expensive or hard to obtain. Case control studies are good to study rare diseases, multiple exposures, or dynamic populations in which follow-up is difficult. As to disadvantages, case control studies are subject to potential biases. Selection bias, due to difficult selection of the control group. Information on exposure is subject to observation bias. Recall bias because of the difficulty of remembering details of exposures accurately. Exposure assessment is most often retrospective and therefore causal interpretation is more difficult. Matching controls to cases will mitigate the effects of confounders, variables associated with the exposure, and the cause of the outcome. Case control studies are inefficient for rare exposures because these studies involve small numbers. Cross-sectional studies measure health information from a selected population at a specific point in time, 
it is important that a representative sample is selected from a population based on defined inclusion and exclusion criteria. Data in cross-sectional studies are usually collected via questionnaires, for example, in health surveys. Outcomes and exposures of participants are measured at the same time. Because data is collected at a particular point in time, they are also called prevalent studies. One example of a large representative cross-sectional study is the Austrian Health Interview Study, or ATHIS. It is conducted regularly every few years by Statistics Austria. The collected information is used to analyze morbidity, health behavior, and health risk factors by age, sex, and socioeconomic determinants. Furthermore, such surveys provide information on the use of healthcare and preventative services. The last wave was conducted between October 2018 and September 2019. A total of 15,461 randomly selected people were interviewed in person. The results are representative of the population aged 15 and older in private households. Cross-sectional studies permit researchers to study multiple outcomes and exposures simultaneously. They provide information about the prevalence of both exposures and outcomes and are a good way of assessing the health needs of a population. Cross-sectional studies are good for descriptive analyses and for generating hypotheses, the foundation for future research opportunities. Because information is collected at a single time point, causality cannot be inferred from cross-sectional studies. It is difficult to determine whether the outcome followed the exposure in time or an exposure resulted from the outcome. The identified associations could be difficult to interpret, and large sample sizes that are representative are necessary to be able to draw conclusions about the entire population. Case studies and case series describe the characteristics of a single patient or a group of people who have the same disease or the same exposure. They often report a new or unique finding, something unusual, or they describe the demographics, clinical presentation, prognosis, or other characteristics of a patient or group of patients who have a particular disease. In 2020, a large case series study evaluated the association between COVID-19 and pneumothorax or pneumomediastinum. Case studies and case series are good to identify new clinical hypotheses or new or unexpected manifestation of a drug or a disease. They are fast and no financial support is needed. But those types of studies have disadvantages because they have no control group, no causal relation between exposure and disease occurrence can be established, the results may not be generalizable, it is difficult to compare different cases, high risk of selection bias because the clinician or researcher self-selects the cases, the patients are not followed up and no future outcomes are presented. Ecological studies are also called correlation studies because they analyze associations between exposure and outcome at the population or group level rather than at the individual level. It is important to know that results from ecological studies apply to a group and not to individuals. So, ecological studies use either aggregate measures, for example, the incidence of diarrhea in selected areas of a country, environmental measures, such as temperature records or amount of rainfall, or surrogate measures of exposure, like data on food purchase instead of consumption data. There are several types of ecological studies. Geographical studies evaluate the geographical correlations between disease incidents and the prevalence of risk factors. For example, data on mortality rates from ischemic heart disease and consumption of wine in different countries. Time trend analyses assess the differences in disease incidence over time. Migrant studies discriminate genetic from environmental causes of geographical variation in disease. Occupation and socioeconomic studies assess the disease incidence according to age and socioeconomic status. In this example of an ecological study, 
The standardized incidence rates of type 1 diabetes mellitus in children up to 14 years were correlated with mean cow's milk consumption in various countries. Ecological studies analyze secondary data. Therefore, they are in general inexpensive and easy to conduct. They are useful for early exploration of relationships and for comparing exposures and outcomes in different populations, for example, in different countries. They are useful in identifying patterns over time. They are also useful for generating questions and highlighting issues that can be investigated in future studies with different study designs. However, ecological studies have several disadvantages. In ecological studies, there is no possibility to control for confounding because aggregate data is used. Therefore, there is a lack of ability to link individual exposure to individual outcome data. Therefore, no causality can be established. In ecological studies, there is the risk of the so-called ecological fallacy. Ecological fallacy is an interpretation error of statistical data that occurs when the association that exists between variables at an aggregate level may not represent the true association that exists at an individual level. One example of ecological fallacy is a correlation between human deliveries and number of storks. The number of storks was highly statistically significantly correlated with the number of human deliveries in 17 European countries. The misinterpretation of correlation data and of p-values leads to unreliable conclusions.